Over the last few weeks, we've been going through Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is part of Paul's letter to the Roman Christians as he was helping them identify and experience this new life and to understand how to transition into living through that and not just living by the law and the restrictions that were there, but be able to live freely within the law. And that was a life that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Now the law that they, they were going by was restricting, it could identify sin, it showed the will and the character of God, but one thing it could not do was to make them holy. And so as Paul was writing this, he was describing that how they would have to turn from their own ways, to turn from their self, to basically burial and death into life with Christ through our baptism and acceptance of our Lord as our Savior. And so in this, he was opening up this opportunity and helping them understand what it meant for us to live in the law rather than just by the law. Those restrictions that were there, but they couldn't bring change. But through Jesus, lives were transformed. We were just slightly changed where we could go back, but he said it's a transformation process that brings new life for us to experience together. Now, last week we experienced the first part of a set of encouragements that Paul begins to give in chapter 8. He was reminding them as they understand that this walk that they're upon, that we've experienced, that there's paths that we're going to have to go down and, and we're going to have to make a choice whether to walk within the things of the Spirit or to walk by our own flesh, our own desires, our own will. But in that, he says, it's not always going to be easy. It won't always just be a simple journey that we're on. And it's going to be challenging. And so how do we live when things get challenging? And how do we face things with confidence when we feel like everything is just in turmoil that's going on around us. And so he wanted to encourage them that it was by the Spirit that you have this blessing that we're able to share. Now today we see another portion of that encouragement that he gives of what it means to allow the Spirit to help us, to intercede for us when we don't understand what to do or how to do it or how we can make it through. We have those moments when we need someone else to speak up for us. And so within this we begin to see that, that calling for as we walk in obedience, as we share, as we saw last week, as all creation waits for this inheritance, for the kingdom of God to awaken, that, that the sons and daughters would walk in obedience, that we would see that creation would rejoice as we turn back to a life in a walking with Christ, walking in obedience as we share together. So that in this steps we begin to see, as we begin to walk in this, that we too would seek this out, and that through Christ he would give us the way as we share together. The Holy Spirit would be there to intercede. And so we see in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 26, and we're just going to go 26 and 27 today. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. When we go through times of suffering, when we go through our trials, as we go through the different things of this life, as we know that it's not always smooth, as we we're warned that he tells us that not only do we share in the blessings with Christ, but also with the trials, we need to understand that we're going to face opposition. It will not always be easy, but it will be worth it, as he says. We share in this together. That there's something bigger taking place Something that's going to help us make it through the trials that we face. The things that will, that will hold us tight here. So Paul has recently been even spreading about how creation would wake and how we all turn back to this, the glory that's to come. That we would live in anticipation of our inheritance with the Father. And then we live for that promise. We live for that, that grand homecoming that we will someday share for all those who believe. And so for us, as Paul was writing, he says, this is the way that's going to help you get there. You're going to get there by following the Spirit. But sometimes we get to that moment, we get to that place within ourselves when so much has gone on and so much, we can only take so much. We, we want to wave the white flag. We want to tap out. We want to say, I'm done. And he says, that's when, when we are done, that's when the Spirit continues to carry us. That's when the Spirit will continue to lead in front of us to intercede on our behalf so that way He will talk to God even when we feel like we've got nothing left, when we're running absolutely on empty. That it's the hope that we have to live. 
a hope that we have to prosper. And so the Trinity in, in unison with the Father in heaven, that we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that is there, he's in part, but also the Father knows, the Father can, can share with that. And so embracing that enables us to have an end with the Father as we understand that the Spirit that is with us now is our part of heaven, is our part of the inheritance that we'll be able to enjoy in full someday at some time when God calls us home. But until then, I've given you the Spirit. He says, I'm leaving myself with you that will dwell within you, not just amongst you, but now within us. And so now we have the Spirit, this part of God with us. And so the Spirit has come to intercede on our behalf, to speak up when we no longer have a voice, no longer we remain silent. See, the word intercede comes to us for this moment when someone would speak up to appeal or to call an audience. And so before God, He's calling to our attention the things that are going on around us, making our case heard before the Father. And this is sometimes difficult because sometimes it's when we like to have control, we like to make sure everything is done our way, it's trusting in that someone else can take what we don't know. And that's what the Spirit does. When we're without words, that's when He speaks up for us. And for us as Christians, the Spirit will intercede on our behalf. It can play a few different roles. The Spirit can come to our aid. It can give comfort. And it enables us to feel in the presence of God. We no longer have to journey to the temple to be there, but he says that it's those moments of comfort. It's that sigh of relief that we feel when things are so overwhelming and so powerful. But as Paul writes, says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And so in the context in which he was writing, to the audience which he was speaking in this, he says it's when our lack of understanding when we regard prayer. See, prayer is difficult. Because in nature, sometimes we just rush through it. We think it's just expected. And sometimes we just don't know what to say. We don't know what we should be put before God. But when we go before trials, and sometimes that's the stage where we are just silent. We don't even know what to talk about anymore. And in this, we see that how many times have we wondered how to pray? Or whenever we're, we're so overwhelmed, anxiety and fear have stricken us, we don't even know what to cry out of. All we do can just groan in, in, in agony and pain for, for what's going on and why is this taking place? What will come of this, Lord? When we don't even know what to ask anymore. And so that's when it says, when we just groan and we ache and we agonize over this. And that's when the Spirit will intercede on our behalf. There's a story about a European seminary professor. And after World War II, it came. To America, and he began to teach at one of the seminaries. His name was Hans, and his wife is Enid. He became a beloved part of the community as he would teach there, and there so often demonstrated the love they had for one another as they would share, as they would walk across campus holding hands, and people would comment about how sweet and how tender their love was. Until one day, Enid tragically passed away. Hans went to a deep and dark place. He went to that pit of sorrow that's so easy for us to go to where there's no explanation. We just lose sight. And when we have no words, we turn away from God. And at some point, the president and a few other colleagues started coming by, offering to pray with him. And he says, I am no longer able to pray to God. And honestly, I don't even know if I believe anymore. There was that awkward moment of silence as they were there sitting together. And then the president responded, then we will believe for you, and we will pray for you. In the following weeks, the four men would gather daily to pray with him, to pray for him. And so one day, months later, they came by, and as he opened the door, he had a smile on his face. He said, I no longer need you to pray for me, but would you come in and pray with me? See, these men were interceding on his behalf, whatever to see hope seemed so distant. It seemed so far away. And so they came together so that they could intercede on his behalf. In the same way, when we feel like we have no words, when it's so hard to believe, that's when the Spirit intercedes on our behalf, taking our needs and our concerns and our groans to the Father as we would share together. See, the Spirit enables us to see hope. The Spirit enables us 
to pray when there are no words, when we don't even know what to say anymore. The interceding isn't in the case of salvation because Jesus had already interceded for us on that behalf. When we often say, I can do this by myself, that's not embracing the role of the Father. Because letting go was the first step in us accepting Christ. And upon allowing him to intercede on our behalf, to pay our sin, to be ransomed for us so that we would be righteous, in the same way now we have to say, Lord, in the midst of this walk with you, I may not understand, I might not know fully, and I have no words, but I know your spirit will intercede and continue to help me follow after you. See, we all have that moment. No matter what we say, we just think it makes it worse. No matter what we do, never brings clarity. More questions arise, doubt, anger, frustration. It's in those moments is when the Spirit will speak out for us. And it's when we're so angry at someone else in the workings of life. We don't know what to say to God. We've been there. We've all been there. But it's how do we handle and how do we not turn away, but how do we turn to? And it's through the Spirit that enables us to cling tight with the Father, to stay close. May we not forget the 23rd Psalm as He leads us and He guides us. He instructs us no matter where we go, God will be there with us. He will lead us through the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, providing shelter and blessing and protection and care. The Spirit is the one interceding on our behalf as He leads us through these different places. If I had to be completely transparent with you, a few years ago when Luke was in the hospital, and we were trying to discover what was ailing him and what was this mystery disease, and to see him labor in pain for weeks, that's where I was. I had tried all the prayers I knew, I had read the scriptures, and I kept coming back to what is at fault? And to the point where I got to that place where all I could do was just groan and grumble and cry out. It was there that I know the Spirit interceded for me. I know it was there in the midst of my sorrow, in the midst of the trial, where I had to let go and I had to trust. To know that Luke was with in the Father's arms. And not my arms but His. Things that I could not control, but things that I could put forward in faith. And that's where the Spirit interceded on our behalf. That's where the Spirit interceded so that we would be able to remain walking with Him. To not let my doubt, my anger, my curiosity, and my questions to turn me away, but to allow me to turn to. I wish there was a simple set of actions I could give you I wish there was a, these are the rules, these are the things that I would tell you to complete this checklist and all things would be made new. That all things would be made right. But we understand that it's not on this side of the resurrection that things are all made right. But upon Christ's return. The thing is though, we're creatures of habit. We want to replicate success just like we've done before. And in that we see that Baseball players, they have their walk-up. They, they have how many times they, they swing the bat, they'll adjust their gloves, fix their hat, tap their cleat, and then dig in the dirt. Because they do that, they know they're going to get a hit. Basketball players and free throws, you do the same routine. To stay in your repetition the same way what brought us success before, we think, well, it was some magical thing. No, what brings us success, what brings us blessing is walking with Christ as we share together that we would focus in on the spirit that God continues to leave for us. And so in that, that's where Paul begins to describe the intensity and the power of the prayers. The groaning nature, he says that we would agonize over this so much that we would long for it so much that we would put it before God with such intensity that all we would do would just sound like a groan and grumble, but the spirit would take those groans on our behalf before the Father. Reminded of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was there and he was crying out, Lord, is there any other way? Could you do this by any other way? Would this cup pass by me? Do I have to take this cup of judgment, of wrath that was due to us, a fallen creation? 
from a perfect Lord and Savior. He took it to be our ransom. But we see in Luke 22, 44, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. There was no need to deny that emotion or the spiritual involvement of prayer that we experience. In the Trinity with Christ, the Spirit, one in fullness with God, is able to take those. Jesus was crying out. He was groaning. He was agonizing. And the Spirit would speak on His behalf. And so while we long to better understand, to better acknowledge, may we not try to limit the power of the Spirit. May we not limit it by our own understanding, but rather increase the strength by our faith and trusting even though what we do not see, it's what we believe. Thankfully, our God is able to understand the Spirit and the Spirit will be with us and report for us. To read verse 27 again of chapter 8, it says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God is the one that has complete access to our heart. His knowledge is direct, not dependent upon one's ability to articulate our concerns. His action is not based by whether I have the right words to say. So often people say, I just don't know what to say when I pray. But when we're present before God, the Spirit can take even our silent moments and you put words to them before the Father. To put our desires and He intercedes on our behalf. For our groans become His. And that's where we begin to see the intercession take place. And within that, that's where we begin to see the hope of glory. The darkness. That that's what brings light to those moments. And it's not just for us the hope of glory as Paul describes but Paul's talking about our deep hurts and our pains. As we face trials and different things, he reminds that the Lord searches our heart. God knows our mind and the spirit. And we're reminded that God is not far from suffering. While God did not create suffering, he is not distant from us either. And so while it's not by his design, he does not allow it to separate us from Him. He intends all things for good, and so He uses this as we share in the blessings and the trials to know the opposition we face are signs of security of the kingdom of God. Because do we understand that as we face these different things, the trials that we face are the story that we share? That's our testimony, church. When we look back and we're able to tell people and show them evidence of how God worked in our lives, it was because of those moments that he gave us a story to share, a story to tell about the works of the Lord in our lives. May we not turn away from that, but find our security in Christ. In chapter 9, as Paul was writing, starting in verse 10, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac, but yet before the twins were born, warned, or had done anything good or bad in the order that God's purpose and elect might stand off, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the order, the older will serve the younger. That God has a calling for you and I. And in this time, the tradition was that the, the oldest would receive the birthright. And while things strategically took place in order for this change to happen, as J Jacob tricked Esau out of the birthright, tricked Isaac into giving it to him, it was reminded us that this was still in line with the sons of Abraham, that this was still in line with the will that God had put in place years before as they walked and they cherished faith. And so in this we know that God was leading them, that God had a plan. And it was not based upon their own will, their own accomplishments, their own heritage, but God's plan is built off the obedience of those who follow him of those who love him, as we share together. 
that we would choose to embrace this life with Him, choose to embrace our calling, and that as we face trials, the Spirit will be there with us to give us a boost of confidence and to intercede when we have no words. And as Paul was writing this, what he was wanting to show was this. God made a promise to his people. God made a promise through Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection that would bring new life to us. And the heart aching thing about this is not all will be with Christ again someday. Not all of us will be there. And he wanted us to be reminded of that. Because in that, may we understand that through our obedience, and while our hearts agonize for those who have turned away, who have went their own way, and have walked away from the will of God, Paul wanted to remind us that God's promise is still there. It's still standing for us. Even though his heart breaks for those who turn away, his promise is still there for those who are choosing to follow, to walk in obedience with him. And because of that, God has maintained that covenant still today. His promise is still in effect for you and I. To cherish as we walk and we follow in obedience. He is not going to break his promise to us. So no matter what we face, or where we go, or what trials are ahead of us, Know we can face them with confidence of Christ, with the presence of the Spirit. And when there are no words, the Spirit will speak on our behalf, interceding on, in place of us, as Jesus has interceded already for us. When we turn and when we trust in Him, when we find strength, when we feel like we're at the, our end, when we just long for answers, turn to Father. Trust in our Father. For He loves the creation. As creation is waiting for us to continue to walk in obedience. He's made a way. We walk in the hand of the Spirit. 